All right, so welcome everybody to this historical session. So today we are gathered around some of the authors and researchers that was heavily involved in writing three princess paper for our field and giving us a reason to be uh, here today. Mainly they were involved in mapping the uh, XCI process to the XGene Activation Center and then discovering and cloning the XGene ex ex story in human first and then mouse. So uh, today, Phil Abner and Hunt Willard are not uh, with us, but we are going to get insights from uh, 1999, yeah. one, sorry, about how it was and how it went. Thank you very much. So I guess, Andre, you have a talk first. Oh, okay. Maybe uh, to be introduced. Uh, ah, maybe I mean, later. Yeah, you take it. <laughs> Can I have my presentation on? <laughs> Do you have a presentation? He does, no. He's organized. We're going to be coming later. You cheater. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm probably the, the only one here who doesn't work on ex, uh, inactivation yeah. anymore. Anymore. Any no, so I, that's my only presentation, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I chose this first slide because, uh, you know, uh, the discovery of exist looks to me like the dark side of the X chromosome. And, uh, okay, so, uh, this one, let's see this. So just to give you an idea how ancient uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, I decided to start with this uh, slide and uh, I think some of you will recognize several people uh, uh, here. Uh, maybe I'll mention a few. Uh, so you have here Peter Goodfellow, the discoverer of the SRY genes, this uh, determining uh, factor. Barbara Mijon, one of the you know, most prominent people working on X chromosome uh, uh, inactivation. This is uh, Victor McCusick. You all know him, of course. Uh, Howard Cook, I think the discoverer, together with others, of the uh, uh, pseudo-autosomal uh, uh, region. And then, of course, Phil Abner, also participated in the discovery of XIS. Ian Craig here in, from Oxford was uh, probably the first one who mapped what was then called exist but to the uh, to the X chromosome uh, long arm. Uh, uh, Tony Monaco, discoverer of the uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene on the X chromosome. Christine Petit, my uh, longtime competitor, uh, <laughs> as you may know. Uh, David Netson, fragile X uh, gene uh, on the X chromosome. You. You know, some of you may recognize who this person here is. So nobody recognizes her? Is it Carmen? That's uh, sorry. That's you. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. I will enlarge this picture. That's me here. Uh, John Van Omen, Kay Davies, of course, you know, so heroes of the, X, of the X chromosome. And this was in Amalfi in uh, 1992. So I'm going to tell you a story, a short story, uh, that started in Naples, just like in this movie, uh, with Clark Gable and the beautiful uh, Sophia Lorenz. So this was a perfect title that I had used in the past. I haven't been using this title for a long time, I have to say. So uh, I was, uh, at the time, in 1984, I was a young uh, pediatrician at the Department of Pediatrics uh, in Naples, and I saw this family, I was working on genetic diseases, and I saw this family with a strange disease association. It was an X-linked uh, recessive inheritance, and uh, affected boys in this family had uh, an X-linked disorder called X-linked ichthyosis, uh, dark scaly skin, 
uh, the dermatological disease, and Kalman syndrome, which was uh, inability to smell, anosmia, um, and uh, hypogonadism, hypogonadotropic uh, hypogonadism. So because the two diseases were X-linked, I simply hypothesized that I was dealing with a co-deletion of adjacent genes on the X chromosome. What uh, they were starting to call these associations uh, contiguous uh, gene syndrome. And of course, the karyotype was normal, normal chromosome at the microscope, but we were hypothesizing a micro deletion, of course. So how do you test this hypothesis at the time? None of the, well, very few genes on the X chromosome had been cloned. G6PD, I'll show you who cloned it, the very first gene on the X chromosome, maybe had two more, that's it. Uh, so, so, so I had a handle on this uh, gene because I, I knew who had generated antibodies against steroid sulfatase, which was an enzyme that was deficient in X-linked ichthyosis. So I thought uh, that maybe I could use the antibodies to clone the gene. And of course, at the time, genes were not found in databases uh, like this. You really had to clone them. And I was very lucky because uh, in Naples, there was Graziella Persico, uh, who, had, who was actually the one who cloned the first gene on the X chromosome, G6PD. And uh, she had this technique imported from the US, actually, that, that you could isolate a gene by immunoscreening using the antibodies of a cDNA library. So I went to her lab uh, to do this. Um, and we use a library, a cDNA library uh, in Lambda GT11 uh, vector. This was an expression library uh, from human placenta. And then we later discovered that this uh, library was made from a, uh, from a placenta of a female baby. <laughs> Then it, was, uh, it didn't make any sense to me. Why do you make an expression library in a female? You miss all the Y chromosome genes, right? I mean, what's the point? And that was the lucky uh, the, uh, situation. Uh, it was made from a female. Uh, so, so I did this screening, and I identified six, uh, six uh, uh, positive clones. And here are the pictures of the positive clones. Uh, it's these dots here. There are purified cDNA clones in uh, this phage library. And they were cross, all cross-reacting with the uh, 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 antibodies against steroid sulfatase. So the next step was to map them to uh, different chromosomes. Of course, uh, we were hoping that they were on the X. And uh, four of them were autosomal, but one was uh, in the right region. It was uh, on the X chromosome. And in fact, STS, steroid sulfatase, had been mapped using enzymatic activity to the distal short term of the X chromosome, XP22.3. So it, you know, I, was, I got really excited that this was the, the right gene. But uh, we also found that, uh, oh, I think uh, there was another, maybe it's in the next slide. So I used this, uh, this clone to test the hypothesis in the family that I showed you before, this one. And you can see that all patients were deleted. And also we got additional families and they were all deleted. There's a huge high frequency of deletions in this disease. By the way, this technique is called Southern blot. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so this actually proved the hypothesis and then we used this strategy to clone many other genes in this region of the X chromosome. We cloned this uh, condodysplasia punctata gene, Kalman syndrome gene, uh, uh, ocular albinism gene, also the mid one gene that was re uh, mentioned by Christine in her talk, uh, midline defect, and, and, so, and some other genes. So, but there was another clone, this one, I think, uh, yeah, here, yeah, here which was also on the X chromosome, but in the wrong region. And the God knows how I identified it, because it sure, for sure this cross-react with the steroid sulfatase antibodies, but of course it's a non-coding gene. And so that's, uh, it was very awkward, and I still don't know, but it was purifying all this uh, through the screening. So I kept it in the drawer for quite some time, like three or four years, until uh, I moved to the US, to Houston, Baylor College of Medicine, 
where I decided to char finally characterize this gene. So I went to a meeting, a Bambury meeting uh, in 1990, and, uh, and there were a Bambury meeting on the X chromosome. There were many people working on the X chromosome, and Hunt Willard presented this uh, uh, deletion map of XQ13, where the X inactivation center, uh, where he mapped the X inactivation center. And uh, so yes, I knew Hunt quite well, so I said, you know, I have a gene that uh, maps to that region. Would you, uh, you know, uh, collaborate with me in further submapping this to the X inactivation center region? Uh, and uh, so we started a collaboration. I sent the clone to Hunt and to uh, Caroline to mapping to the X inactivation center region and also to analyze the X inactivation status. Of course, I, I was uh, hypothesizing that uh, this gene may, may escape X inactivation. That was a possibility, but not necessarily, uh, because I was working on steroid sulfates that was also one of the first genes to escape X inactivation, even if David doesn't believe that genes escaped X inactivation. <laughs> but we had actually pretty solid proof at the time uh, that uh, STS was one of the genes escaping uh, uh, X, in, uh, X inactivation. Of course, I would never uh, think that this gene that was much more than that, actually. Uh, so uh, sure enough, uh, then I got this, uh, we, uh, Hans showed me this result that exists for right at the, in the middle of the X inactivation center region, right here. And, and, uh, and so what about the X inactivation status? Uh, I remember that Hunt invited me to give a seminar Caroline was, of course, was there, and uh, and uh, and then he showed me this data, and uh, just the very first uh, set of data that he showed me, was, I was shocked because you know the he showed me this uh, this plot here. <laughs> Caroline knows it quite well, so you could see that you know the, all the I mean he had a very good collection of inactive X hybrids and also of active X hybrids, separating the two uh, uh, different type of X chromosomes, and also aneuploidies, uh, X, you know, sex chromosome aneuploidies. And you could see that, of course, it was only expressed, this gene was only expressed in the, uh, uh, by the inactive X chromosome and not by the active X chromosome. And uh, as a consequence, and I think he put this as a control, male and female RNA, you know, they don't, Usually when you have a control over a northern blot or, or a slot blot like this, you don't pay attention to the, really to the sex. But here you see that this was expressed only in females and not in males. So that's something unheard of, right? I mean, it was completely unheard of uh, that a, a gene would be expressed only in females and, and, and not in males. But of course, with the exception of males with, the, with the multiple uh, uh, X chromosomes. So this was really, uh, 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 shocking uh, uh, to me. And so we went on and characterized also the sequence of the gene, and we found a, an extremely high frequency of uh, alternative splice transcripts. I mean, uh, pretty much each uh, transcript that we found was alternatively spliced. And, uh, and also, no open reading frame whatsoever. So, in fact, this uh, was the just evidence of a long non-coding uh, 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 DNA, RNA. Um, so one very last anecdote is this. So when I <laughs> visited Hans, so he showed me this, uh, this data and he had already named the gene. <laughs> so, and that's the way he named the gene, exit, X inactive transcript. And I thought there was something wrong with this name because, you know, X inactive transcript would also be the transcript of genes escaping X inactivation, right? And uh, they are also X inactive transcript. So, so I suggested to add the S here, <laughs> also because I like more the, uh, the exist, you know, like I exist and I do exist. And, you know. <laughs> and so that's, it was, that's what it was, it was exist. Uh, and uh, because it was, a transcript specific for the X chromosome. Uh, I really thank the organizer for inviting me, even if I don't work on X inactivation uh, 
anymore. Uh, I, it was very nice to meet again with some of my uh, colleagues and heroes of the time. And uh, I noticed that uh, a, a lot of progress have been made uh, in uh, <coughs> understanding exist function, <laughs> even though even though I think some of the main questions that we were asking 30 years ago are still <laughs> being asked today. And so a lot to do uh, still. Thanks. Oh. One last thing. I didn't mention the mouse uh, gene that we cloned in collaboration with uh, Phil Avner. And the reason why I didn't mention it is because I'm sure that uh, uh, Neil and Sohela will uh, mention it, but Phil was a great collaborator of mine. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Andrea. I mean, just was great uh, to learn how uh, you would actually find genes in a time where you could not just Google them, <laughs> how we do it now. It's very interesting. And it's really an honor to have you here and all of you um, to bring us back to this time. And actually, uh, Soraya has a question for you, Andrea. So well, well, first of all, it, it just breaks my heart to hear that, that that clone was sitting in the freezer for three years <laughs> before, you, before it, ca it came to light. But to this day, I mean, at the time, I was I mean, delighted that it was found, but mystified how it could have possibly have come out of an expression library screened with an antibody, <laughs> given that it doesn't make a protein. Yeah, so I mean, it, one possibility is that this uh, uh, sequence that is in, was in the phage uh, was uh, in the library was making a, a peptide, a, a, po a protein that was in some way cross-reacting uh, with uh, uh, the antibodies against this enzyme. Um, I mean, exist was a very abundant uh, uh, transcript, uh, so it was not difficult for us to, uh, then to purify it and also to clone uh, additional, you know, cDNAs uh, from other libraries. Uh, so. That's the only hypothesis I, can, I could come up uh, uh, with. I can, what I can tell you is that uh, it was uh, very consistent. In fact, we, had the, we went through multiple rounds of purification. When you, you were screening cDNA libraries, you would do a primary screenings, and we had some positives, very, very few, six. And then you would do secondary with the dilution, and then tertiary with another dilution until you get purified plaques. Mm -hmm. And it was going through the process uh, uh, beautifully. So I don't know. I mean, maybe there's something uh, interesting there. I don't know. I, I, had, I had never pursued this. It may have been serendipitous, of course. OK. Do you have any so, ideas, Carolyn? Well, Is certainly all of our subsequent walks, we just use expression live or not protein expression. We just use cDNA library. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So but we looked for open reading frames. I mean, Andrea showed the slide, but every region, particularly in those small exons that are LNX3 derived, it's just sure there'd be an open reading frame there. They at least look like a gene. Um, and yeah, at that point in time, something else that you guys probably can't even imagine, all the sequencing was manual. So we had very large sequencing gels that you would pour the acrylamide, radioactively label, <laughs> run the gel, and yet we resequenced those regions over and over and over looking for the open reading frame, but there's a stop everywhere. Right. But maybe a small open reading frame, uh, uh, which is not, uh, of course, uh, uh, working in, uh, in the physiological context, but in the library, maybe enough uh, for to make a like a, a short protein or uh, that would cross react with the antibodies. I think that's a possibility. I mean, I was so happy to see Neil's sequence of the mouse and that we had no overlapping regions and. Yeah, that because were I, th I, think, I think we were at the time sending sequences backwards and forwards, <laughs> the mouse sequence and the, and the human sequence, which helped because it was hell sequencing through all those repeats as well. It was very difficult, wasn't it? I mean, imagine yeah. that uh, when, when, I, when I started to sequence the, the steroid sulfatase gene, I put it in the database. The database was extremely limited and I couldn't find any similarity with anything. So to do the, the next round of comparison, I had to wait uh, 
uh, to receive a new, a new floppy disk from, <laughs> from, the, from the US. <laughs> and it, it, the floppy disk with the update of the protein uh, uh, databases will come every four months. You might have to explain to and the, what a floppy disk <laughs> <laughs> The floppy disk. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so the next time, after four months, there was a bacterial sulfatase uh, being uh, identified, so I could compare it with that. So yeah, we really, you know, this was before email, before uh, PCR, I mean, <laughs> before many things. So actually, how did you get convinced that you got a um, non-coding gene? Because I guess at the time it was not so common. Nowadays we got thousands of non-coding RNA genes, but at the time it would be the first one, and then you find it in an immuno screen. How did you get convinced about your discovery? Uh, yeah, so looking for the open reading frame, not finding it, and then collaborating with Jeannie Lawrence, who's here at the meeting, and actually seeing that the exist RNA localized right. within the nucleus. Because then it sort of makes sense that you're not leaving the nucleus so you don't get translated into a protein, and then you don't have to try and find which X you came from. Um, so I think it really wasn't until I saw that localization yeah. that I was convinced, but. In, in a way, we were all a bit kind of um, caught in this, this uh, strange dichotomy in that we knew from all the classical work and stuff that Sahela taught me about, and, and, um, uh, and uh, Leigh and Russell and people showed is that whatever it was we were looking for functioned in cis. So actually looking for an open reading frame didn't make a lot of sense because how is this gene going to be tr you know, transcribed, go out of the nucleus, translated, and then bring a protein back into the nucleus and go to that specific chromosome? It, it didn't add up. So it, we were kind of all along thinking, oh, actually it would make sense if it wasn't. But yeah. at the same time thinking, but, you know, there must be but, no but all genes frame. make open reading frame. Open reading <laughs> yeah, frame yeah. Because we didn't, we didn't yeah. have a Another good evidence. Other uh, than ribosomal. You know, well, and H19 was just about that. Yeah, yeah, it was that thing. So talking with at the, same the Thielman lab and, and the fact that they really thought that their RNA didn't yeah. have an open reading frame. But then it didn't do anything when they not. But then it yeah. didn't do anything. <laughs> but another evidence that there was not. Was this uh, extremely high frequency of alternative splicing, right? So we found that if almost any uh, transcript that we were pulling out was alternative spliced, and so how can you maintain a, a protein sequence with such a high frequency of alternative splicing? That was also something weird, very weird. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it kept going so far. Like that first exon was so big. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you could never tell whether what you had was attached to the end because, um, yeah. be, because the reason, we're telling dirty secrets about exist. So, so the reason that Andrea showed a sloth plot is because my northerns never looked as nice as Neil's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. The, the beautiful northerns were playing K. So, uh, so there's some people not in the room here uh, who, who made massive contributions. Um, and our effort in, in uh, the UK, in London, was, was massively helped by two, two people, uh, Graham Kay, who's that beautiful northern, and, uh, and also Alan Ashworth, who helped uh, with, with... So, so Alan Ashworth, he was, he was kind of like a, a massive extension of our, of our capability. Yeah, he was based He's in a different lab in London. In, so in a Chesapeake He played a big lab. part, yeah. A really smart guy. Because it's very hard to get a 17, 19 kilobase RNA intact onto a northern blot. Yeah. Something else none of you have ever seen. Um, but mine tended to show smears. In fact, the first time, so Hunt Willard was my supervisor. I was a PhD student at the time. The first time I showed Hunt my northern, I said, and you know what's really cool? This is only showing up from the inactive X. And he just laughed at me. <laughs> uh, he said, there isn't even a band. <laughs> and he said, I'll go back to Andrea. And I think he has sequence. And so Andrea got, gave a sequence, and then I could do an RT-PCR and actually yeah. show Hunt a band, which finally convinced him that maybe it was only from the inactive X. But then he said, go do females, males, multiple X individuals. Right. <laughs> and I think we also, um, 
we also showed, in fact, in fact, it was an experiment I did with my own hands because I couldn't persuade anybody in the lab to do it um, to see whether it would actually be loaded out onto polytones, whether it would actually come out of the nucleus. And um, so nobody wanted to do that experiment. And um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it myself. Um, so I, I put on a lab coat and created Havoc in the lab, but it worked the first time. And then the second time, I had lots of... Uh, Lots of willing, willing helpers. <laughs> so, um, so that was kind of, you know, we were convinced then that it just it never came out of the nucleus, essentially, and it just stayed there and did, it, did its work in the, in the nucleus. By listening to you talking, it seems like it was really a collaborative effort and that uh, you were not competing together to, for the discovery of exit. It was really a collaboration. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, by listening to you talk, I was having the feeling that it was more a collaborative effort to characterize exist rather than a competition between labs. Well, we, I mean, we, we, everyone was, once it was, once this was, was published, everyone, we were competing, but we were collaborating with Maris and Hume, and we were competing with Phil and you. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. On the so, mass, so. so Caroline and I were collaborating and for the human gene, and then Sohela and, and Neil and, uh, and, and my group were competing, right? That's but correct. I didn't That's actually correct. know that uh, until, uh, when, until we submitted the paper that you also had submitted. Yeah, the, yeah. So we published back to back in, in Nature. But, but, and, and, mm -hmm. and we both published really fast after, because from January, from, from your paper to, to May, to the, mass, to, to the mass paper, but that's because we were all we were also kind of set up and ready to go. Right. Because I'd, <laughs> I'd spent pretty much all of the 80s trying to find the X inactivation center in the mouse, working on the mouse. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, w what we were doing, we were progressively narrowing down the region that it had to be with, um, with translocations and, and deletions and then making um, genetic and physical maps across the region. And, of course, we were helped very much by Steve Brown with, the, with making the... Um, the genetic maps, and one of the questions... Right, Steve was also in the picture. He was. Yes. But one, one of the questions that, that I was always asked, and I didn't have an answer for it, was um, how will you know when you, when you find the activation <laughs> center? Because it was a concept. It was just a concept. It wasn't, it wasn't an entity. And I always said, I maintained and I believed it, and it turned out to be true, that when we saw it, we would recognize it. And that's, <laughs> and, that's, and, that's, and, that's and that's exactly what uh, that's exactly I, I, what I've not heard that before, but I, at another of the X meetings, somehow this one was in Italy. The one I remember was in Yale, uh, <laughs> which is not as pretty. Um, and I met Hans Brunner, and he yeah. said, "What are you doing?" And I said, oh, "I'm going to clone the X inactivation center," and he sent me a paper that I'd asked. And on the top, it said, good luck cloning the X inactivation center. And I was just at Agnes's poster. And she said she was probably over-optimistic. And I, I think as a graduate student, I thought, well, of course I'll know what it is when I stumble across it. You and right. he said, well, what, it, what are you looking for? Well, something special. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you know, that's why it was called the X inactivation center not the X inactivation gene, because <laughs> nobody knew that it was a, a gene or a single gene. It was just a region, right? Yeah. So the center could have been something like metaphysical. Yeah, absolutely. Right? But it was actually a gene. <laughs> so. But yeah, as I was trying to clone the X inactivation center, I figured that Sohela and Neil were the competition, but they were cloning the mouse one, and it would be interesting whatever it was. What really impressed me, the hybrids that Andrea showed you, those were from human X chromosome rearrangements. And in order to be informative for whether or not the X inactivation center was there, they had to be unbalanced. So it had to be an X rearrangement that was viable when it was passed on into a female, unbalanced, and then you would inactivate it. And despite that, we got down at the time to 1.2 1 megabases, eventually to 800 kilobases, physical mapping by X chromosome rearrangement. Yeah. Uh, power of human genetics, because actually we didn't get anywhere near as close with the mouse. When we were five yeah. megabases, six megabases. Yeah. Although you, yeah. you had the power to go further. 
to generate more deletions, whereas we had no power. We had to, serve, we had to do it with what the with world the gave us. The nation <laughs> Yeah, but we, we, we also, I mean, in the sense that we were relying on trans classical translocations on the one hand, and these spontaneous deletions in XXES cells, which were random deletions of big chunks, and um, we, we didn't kind of go back and try and find, find, do fine mapping with no. them. And it was Plus, cool. you also had XCE. Oh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, we that still, had to come up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we still, you know, the jury might still be a little bit out on XCE. I don't know. Um, I don't see much of the meeting. Somebody correct me. It's a shame Phil didn't make it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure he'd have a thing or two to say about it. Does anybody <laughs> have any thoughts about that? Does, any, does everybody know what XCE is? <laughs> Maybe you can just recapitulate. Quickly. Well, it's your. It <laughs> But it really should be um, Sahela to tell that story because uh, well, she also worked with Bruce Katanak, who, 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 who sadly died um, relatively recently. Well, so, so, so XCE, it's, it was a region of the X chromosome, roughly in the X inactivation. So what it stands for, it stands it for X, X controlling, controlling element. element, so not X inactivation. Rough, roughly in the, in the region where we knew the uh, X inactivation center was, and it affected the randomness of X inactivation, so it skewed the randomness of X inactivation. And it was actually, Bruce found it initially when he was looking at mice with the, which were heterozygous for his translocation, his insertion, which has a bit of chromosome 7 inserted into the X chromosome containing the albino gene. And X inactivation spreads into the um, albino gene. And so um, you get, um, depending, you, you configure the genetic background you get white patches on a dark animal and so it was it was initially it was affecting the the, the spread of inactivation in it thought to be spread, the spread of inactivation into the autosome but it turned out subsequently that XEE actually affects the chances of a, a chromosome carrying it being inactivated so there were three alleles a B and C strong medium and weak and mispressus Wild mice have a have a strong XCE, and interestingly, um, in the work, in the very early work that um, we did, um, a muspressus had a, seemed to produce more exist than um, than mus domesticus. But w whether that means anything, I don't know. I, mean, I still don't. I still don't know exactly. I wish I wish Phil was here. He would explain XCE to us because he's got us some insights. I think. Yeah. Some other people probably know about this, but I believe that there are, um, you know, it's, it's not an allelic series from exactly the same place. It seems that the different XE alleles are using different effects near exist. But I mean, as we surmise, I mean, they're most likely influencing the chance of exist being activated on a given X chromosome yeah, by yeah. somehow uh, influencing the regulatory machinery of, yeah, of that exist yeah, gene in yeah, cyst. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, on the, on the, on the, on the, we're talking about Catnax translocation the, um, the, with a bit of chromosome 7 inserted into the X. For a long time, that really confused the issue in the mouse world because people didn't believe that there was a single X chromosome because you could get the X chromosome on either side of this insertion inactivated and, and the, bit, the bit in the middle sometimes didn't get completely inactivated. So lots of people believed for quite a lot of time that there must be at least two X inactivation centers. Well, I knew that couldn't be right, which was to my advantage because nobody else, not, not nobody else, but lots of people didn't believe that there was a, a single X inactivation center. So we were, we were able to... Um, yeah, that, that was my default PhD statement, was that if I couldn't find the X inactivation center, at least I'd prove there weren't two. Because <laughs> I believed that there weren't two. It's, it's interesting, belief comes into this quite a lot, doesn't it? Belief and serendipity. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. As long as you know, you know what to look for, uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, we were really lucky because we got this clone from Andrea, but we had this panel, we were mapping the X inactivation center, but we also had this panel of active and inactive hybrids because we were, we were looking at genes that escaped inactivation. So the first thing we did with everything that came yeah. in, and that's why I thought it was fun that Kay Davies was there. Kay Davies sent us a, a gene, SB1.8, and we looked, and sure enough, it escaped inactivation. 
um, and we were mapping them in these hybrids based on a temperature sensitive mutation. Well, those genes turn out to be SMIC1A and EBA1, some of these classic constitutive escapers. So it was just luck that we had all those resources and all these escapees. Great. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you have some questions, you can also ask them. There will be micro microphones. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Carolyn. <laughs> um, I was struck by Andrea's description of the antibody staining and the unsolved mystery. W wow. And I, I think this must have been ruled out, but um, in like certain genes involved in ALS where there's a, a repeat expansion, um, there's RAN translation, um, and you know, they discovered little tiny peptides that don't start with AUG that are in repeat regions. And so I don't like my question, <laughs> and I'm sure it's probably not true, but is there any chance that there is some kind of little tiny peptides produced? So, so it's basically going back to the expression library right. and suggesting that, that maybe there are small peptides produced from repetitive regions in ALS proteins, for example, that could be something similar going on here. And uh, I mean, something like that makes sense. And this antibody is probably not a great antibody, I imagine. Right. So These are uh, uh, polyclonal. Uh, and I mean, I, uh, I'm very grateful to the guy in the Netherlands who generated these antibodies. You know, but, and I, I forgot the name. But, uh, but the, the other. <laughs> this guy. Oh, the it was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> but, uh, but, the, but the antibodies were not great. So of course, when you, these are not perfect uh, technique. I mean, it's not like sequencing that you have a match immediately, or this is just, uh, uh, you know, with all these screen techniques are not perfect. So you, you particularly with the polyclonal antibodies, uh, you get uh, material, you know, cross-reacting with the antibodies. Uh, and in some cases, this cross-reaction doesn't mean anything. Uh, in some other cases, there's a, you know, there's a mechanism behind it uh, to be discovered. Uh, most likely, in this case, it was just uh, uh, something, uh, uh, you know, uh, but serendipitous. Uh, but uh, for me, that I was working on the X chromosome, uh, and I also, in some way, work, was working on X inactivation because STS was a, one of the few genes escaping X inactivation. It, when I saw that the mapping was in XQ13, it was uh, something interesting, right, to be pursued. Uh, and so when I saw that there was a possibility to submap it more precisely with the hybrids that they had generated, I said, oh, that's what we should do immediately, right? Uh, and, but, and of course, uh, as Caroline said, one possibility was that this gene would escape X inactivation, but nobody thought about the possibility that it would only be a, expressed by the inactive because of, of course inactive was called inactive because you know it would not express any gene that, that except the ones that, are, that escape X inactivation so yeah if anybody wants to go looking it, it, that original clone that would would contain the e repeat but not any of the a or B or right so it, it did or it, you're it would it would include the e it would repeat. include the e repeat I see. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't even know that. Yeah. yeah I <laughs> <laughs> Howard. Hey, thank you, everybody, for sharing these uh, really fantastic historical perspective. Can you talk to us about the process of getting this paper reviewed? Papers reviewed, right? Because, like nowadays, you might get a question like, "Wow, you have this uh, XI specific expression. What is the mechanism?" Or you have this non-coding RNA that you, you, you claim in silence of chromosome. What is the mechanism? Well, you would get a question like that, right? And then you couldn't be allowed to publish it until you worked out the mechanism. Um, so. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a fascinating question because, you know, at the time, Nature Papers, there wasn't any supplemental data. <laughs> <laughs> and it, in fact, the Cell Paper, we actually published the sequence yeah, the whole sequence is there. Uh, yeah. Really yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you see, I mean, a paper is never a complete story, right? That, and it was so new 
and so shocking in some way, you know, genes as expressed only in females and not in males, and that of course, even if you didn't, we didn't have the mechanism, I think uh, it was something, it was definitely an issue paper. I, I think what surprised me. Actually, two nature papers. It was the two back to back. One was the, the mapping and the cloning of the gene. I think, I don't know if you, if you saw that. There's yeah. two of them. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, somehow Hunt got that through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was Hunt, actually. <laughs> I, I think what really surprised me was how people just accepted it. Like we were, we were, I think, still proving it. You know, wanting to know no open reading frame, wanting to see the localization from Jeannie. And, and I think Jeannie would agree. People just said, "Oh, yeah, cool. It's controlling X and activation." And I thought that was still a jump. What do you feel? Uh, it's the same, although I, th I think people were waiting for something because, you know, X and activation had been around for a long time. <laughs> and the fact that it functions in cis had been around for a long time. So, um, you know, there's an element of, uh, um, you know, th there's a lot of, you know, people have long been intrigued by, you know, this as a, as a weird molecular mechanism. So people have been waiting for this thing to come along to explain this. How, how is it that? single chromosome in cis. And, um, so but I think that's partly why it had that, that good reception, including editors, I think. You know, they knew that yeah. it was uh, yeah, they knew a, 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 a very yeah. wide interest. Yeah. And I, th I think if I, remember, if I remember rightly, we didn't have to push too hard either, because I remember it sometimes it was, as, I, I think, I, I'm not quite, I don't even know if I should say this, but I sometimes we sent something to nature and we said, if you don't want it, tell us quickly because we're going to send it to yes, cell. Did say that. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes there was a little, there was a little bit of a tug, tug of love. So, so the, the sort of the door, the, the door was open, and it was a, it was, it was um, quite a. You did that with the Andropartheno story, that that Graham Kay and, and Azim Sarani I did. collaboration, I did. and you I were did. in a hurry, and you said. Yeah, I must say, everybody liked it liked it uh, very much. You know, I remember. It, we submitted an R01 grant, and also Hunt submitted another R01 grant, but they both got first percentile. I mean, it was something, even the Italian newspapers liked it very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that I still keep an article, wrote, an Italian discovers the secret of women. <laughs> <laughs> That's very Italian. Very Italian. <laughs> 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 maybe as a quick follow-up to this, um, maybe to Carolyn and Neil, yeah. actually, as you were the grad students at the time. No, he was a, he did, Neil was not a grad student. Ah, no. he was a postdoc. <laughs> Very <laughs> senior postdoc. Yeah, on my second postdoc. Carolyn was yeah. a postdoc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, so at the time, would you have thought that this discovery would have had such a broad impact on many different... Um, research topics as we see now here, like BD structure, epigenetics, and many more. Did you think this would be possible or? Well, I think we all loved X chromosome inactivation already. I mean, it was Mary Lyon's hypothesis um, that was so groundbreaking. We were just trying to answer the questions that she'd already raised. And I, I think the contrast, you ask about it being accepted. I mean, it was accepted pretty quickly, whereas Mary Lyon's hypothesis, <coughs> she had a hard time convincing hard time. the world. Well, also, she, she was a woman, and Grunenberg was against her. So, <laughs> you know, and it was, a, it was a while back. Right. So, yeah. I mean, just, just, just. Uh, to add to that, I mean, like, like Carolyn, I, I, the thing I kind of remember is just that kind of anxiety of worrying about, well, is, is, is this really the thing? I mean, it, you know, <laughs> in those days, it wasn't, you know, a few weeks to do a CRISPR experiment and get a, a nice answer. It, it took us years to get to a point, you know, and it was progressive where we could be sure, a bit like J James and, and RSX, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard work to get the definitive experiments done. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, we're less convinced probably than the rest of the <laughs> I, I, In many ways, I think uh, so. I mean, I, I woke up one night thinking, oh, it, it could just all be an artifact yeah. of how things purify from cells. Uh, 
and had to do a whole series of experiments, as Sohela says, about polygons, you know, to I guess try and prove these yeah. things to yourself. I mean, I guess the, no the knockout, the yeah. though, in mouse showed that it was necessary and sufficient right. for, yeah. for X inactivation, and that was kind of the, the knockout the the transgene the experiments yeah, yeah, from yes. uh, Jeannie and Rudy. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. So, so may, may I ask a question to the organizers? So, uh, I'm quite nostalgic, I mean, but uh, have you ever considered to, instead of running a meeting on X inactivation, uh, running a mini meeting of, on X chromosomes, uh, or sex chromosomes? Uh, because you know the the because <laughs> you know that maybe the, I think uh, this would be beneficial. I think for both fields because uh, after all the two topics are very much connected. Uh, so I, I guess I don't know. I, I don't I know. I get the opinion that every time somebody organizes this meeting, they say they're never organizing another. And so <laughs> thank you very much yeah. to the organizers. <laughs> I mean, we, we did have a discussion at the beginning about whether we should make it a more broad sex chromosome meeting, but right. the, the potential audience for a sex chromosome meeting would be, I think, quite enormous. Huge. And Embo were already running a meeting, I think, on sex differences and sexual dimorphisms. Um, so since we hadn't been together also as a community, X and activation community for so long, we felt that we should keep it focused, I think. That's true. Do you want to ask us something? Yeah. You had your hand up before. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the historical view, especially as a guy just starting the PhD. It's amazing to hear all this story. Um, so it's been 62 years, and you know, luckily the mechanism has been more and more discovered. But I wanted to ask you, for each of you, which is still the most outstanding question that remains to be answered. Mm. <laughs> maybe, maybe a tough one, sorry. I, uh... Fair on you to do your out. I mean, I, I could, uh, well, I could, I could have my own, my own out, um, favorite question. Is I, I think it's still very mysterious how, how exist is um, staying associated with the single chromosome in cis, how exist RNA, yeah, that, that's the one for me. I think that we, we've got a much better understanding of how exist molecules do silencing. I think, I think there's uh, been good progress on that, but I still think there's, there's lots of questions in my mind about how on earth does it manage to, to stay on the same chromosome. Yeah, because it would be very dangerous, wouldn't it, if it, um, well, yeah. if it didn't? Yeah. <laughs> if you'd have it. Well, yeah, there was a bit about that in a talk yesterday, which uh -huh. you oh, from, well. from Mitch Goodman, but yeah, oh, that, right. that's a sort of a uh, theme that, that mm -hmm to get the right mm. amount. Mm. Yeah, for me too, it would be, it made sense that it's a long non-coding RNA expressed from the inactive X, but that's 155 megabases that you've got to get to. Yeah. Uh, right. And then it falls, you know, Jeannie again showed it, it falls off on mm. every cell division. Wow, mm. yeah. So then if we go back historically, when you discovered that, what was the experiment, the first thing you were thinking for the next, you know, next paper, the next question, because especially at that time, you know, there's what you think about and then there's what you can do. So, you know, when you discovered it, were you frustrated on experiments you couldn't do or questions you could not answer that maybe have been answered since? Uh, yeah, so everything I've ever, bet on about exist, <laughs> except that it was really important, has been wrong. Mm. Um, <laughs> and so my, you know, the first experiment that one should do is get going on a mouse knockout. And Hunt said, so we were a, a human genetic lab, should we get a mouse collaborator and start doing a knockout? And I said, it, it's going to be male sterile. <laughs> There's no point. <laughs> and we looked instead at what happens in somatic cells when exist is gone, which obviously was the wrong choice. And then when we looked in somatic cells, we said, well, it's not doing anything. <laughs> so I was so relieved when the knockout finally did something because I kept proving that it really wasn't important <laughs> despite dedicating my research career to it. So uh, actually, at the very beginning, uh, 
one of the things that we were sp speculating together with uh, Caroline and Hunt was uh, whether it was really exist, uh, you know, RNA that was doing the job, or was it was the act of transcription of that region of the uh, X chromosome. I think you remember this. This was the. Uh, so I wonder. Actually, I haven't followed the field that quite closely, but if so, if. If it exists is expressed in, other, in another region of the X chromosome, would do the same job, or is it important that it's there? Has anybody addressed this? Uh, yeah, yeah, and lots of work, obviously. It's, it's probably it doesn't make not autosomes, but also right. um, other positions on the X chromosome. And I, and I think um, Charles Darwin look alike at the back. Um, <laughs> responsible for uh, the experiments there, so Anton Woods's experiments, uh, I think it was the, you know, the first with the inducible existed. Right, right. But then um, uh, um, that included uh, an inducible exist on, a, on an autosome. Right. So, uh, th and then the other thing, I, I saw a paper several years ago uh, uh, speculating the possibility of using exist for therapeutic uh, purposes to mm -hmm. turn off uh, deleterious uh, uh, genes. Uh, I don't know. Oh, well, Chini will yeah. probably talk so, about but that. But has this been pursued in any way? Because this is something that I also had thought because I was working on human diseases and I thought maybe this is a tool to do that. But I'm, I'm betting on Jeannie Lawrence talking about that tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> if, if not, there are posters from her. Ah, but great. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think if this uh, group of of minds and and hard work were were put more to that question, which we have been working on, and we've gotten encouraging answers, I think it's possible um, that exist could be used therapeutically or at least experimentally to f find drug pathways and things. So anyway, I think it's a, it's a question worth considering further. It's a challenge, but it, it's possible. So maybe l as we are in the last 10 minutes of the session, uh, we would like to present Anya with that when we see the panel of, we were struck by the fact that half of you stayed in the field of sex inactivation and half of you <laughs> decided to do something else. And what we found very interesting is, for instance, why so Ida, you decided to move out of. So, so uh, I don't think it's a secret. I, I um, left X and activation to find God. And actually, it was harder finding, um, uh, it was just as hard, if not harder, <laughs> finding <laughs> God as it was understanding X and activation. And then I didn't find God. So I came back and I, and, and I, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, then I did a whole bunch of other things. So then I, um, and I needed, I needed to, in order to find God, I'd given up all my money and my house and I needed to, uh, to make some money. So I didn't go back into academia. I went into the pharmaceutical industry and then biotech and then a bunch of, a bunch of other things. But I've, but I've always been very interested in X and activation. And thank goodness there was Neil doing all the wonderful stuff that he's done, he's done subsequently on it, so, yeah. So then why did you choose to stay? <laughs> oh, gosh, um, it seemed like the sensible thing to do. I, uh, it, it, it just, just um, life carries you on, on paths sometimes, and, and actually um, I, I had thought I was going to be heading off after postdocing with, with Sahela, but Sahela stepped down, and. Uh, they said, please carry on the work. And, and my thought was actually, um, many of you from the mouse community may know this character, Jeff Friedman, who was at the Rockefeller, who discovered um, uh, leptin, the, the obesity hormone. And we've become friends because he was uh, postdocing, uh, he was visiting Steve Brown's lab when I was doing my first postdoc there. And I was planning to go off to the Rockefeller and, and work with him trying to clone leptin. So, you know, that's there, but. But for, for the grace of God, you know, you know, that might be a different, reason, different <laughs> yeah. path. But this is the way it You'd have been out. richer. You'd have been richer I'd if you got richer. a few. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 so it's certainly been a very happy journey, work, work, you know, working on Exist. I mean, I still get really excited about stuff, you know, all, all, these, all these years on. So I think that's, that's, that's all you can ask for is if you're in, in, you know, enjoying 
trying to discover stuff. Yeah, I think it's interesting, sort of the similarity that circumstances let us stay with the topic, you know, because you are supposed to leave behind your topic and move on. Um, Hunt Willard, with whom I did my PhD um, during my career with him, left Toronto where I started with him, went to Stanford, and then he left Stanford and went to Case Western. And so everybody says you're supposed to leave, but I'd already been at three universities, so I, I didn't feel that I had to leave because <laughs> I kept getting to go to a new place. And had, had I stayed, he then moved to Duke, but I didn't stay. I went back to Canada. Um, so it, I, the questions are just so fascinating, but I think had I switched to another field, I'm sure I would have found those as fascinating as well. But I, I didn't feel the pressure to do so, and I've had a wonderful time with it. But also, going back to your earlier question about we don't sound like competitors, I think with competitors like this, X and activation has always been a very nice field um, where you, you talk about things and you share wild ideas and people tell you what's wrong with them, but they don't shoot you down. <laughs> They let you down softer. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in my case, it was different. That, so I was in love, actually, with the X chromosome. And, but I, at the time, I was uh, a gene hunter. Uh, <laughs> and I was you know, hunting uh, for disease genes uh, with my background uh, uh, as originally a, a pediatrician. And so the choice was, do I go one gene after the other and then to the next gene and then to the next gene? Or I, I just focus on the disease genes that I had identified to, uh, uh, to work on the mechanism. And so I slowly moved away from the X chromosome, from X inactivation, but even from genetics. I, in the past uh, 15 years or, or, or so, I go only to cell biology meetings and some biochemistry signaling, uh, but uh, I don't even go to the American Society of Human Genetics meeting anymore, it's, uh, which is uh, absurd. You know, uh, that was my meeting you know, where I would always go there. So it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was an interesting journey, and I think uh, changing field in some cases gives you a competitive advantage because you see things with a different perspective, different uh, approach that you can use. But of course, I'm nostalgic, so, and so this meeting, I mean, I really thank the, the organizer for inviting me because uh, it's, uh, it's a great topic, fantastic topic. But of course, you need the specific expertise on epigenetics and, uh, and of course, uh, chromatin, which I didn't have at the, at the time. Well, thank you very much. Maybe we can do one final round of the question that uh, we can have. Ah, sorry, I didn't. Oh, no, sorry. I just want back to this uh, no coding RNA. I, back, 22, uh, back uh, 20 years ago, I'm a grad PhD student. I studied the uh, no coding RNA in Drosophila, the rocks. I think they got the name similar as it exists. They call the RNA on X chromosome because they, on, they can on the both X chromosome, right? Because they work in chains. And so we basically follow the exist studies, like Anton Woods study, you know, deletions and uh, it's so amazing. They both totally different system for dosage compensation. Long local DNA in Drosophila have two, LOX1 and LOX2, and they functional redundant, and their sequence not have similarity, and their function is so similar, and they have similar function as exist. You can code the whole X chromosome, right? This is no coding on it, and that's why we always asking, oh, maybe also happens in C. elegans, maybe also happens in these mosquitoes, right? So far, I don't think C. elegans, uh, Barbara, probably, ah? Uh? Well, we haven't found your RNA. Right, not found it yet, right? But <laughs> do you guys can, s <laughs> <laughs> can speculate for this long range or like chromosome-wide regulations, why they need this long no-coding RNA as master regulators? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you can really make the comparison between rocks and, and, and things like exist. I mean, exist 
has 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 a beautiful um, homology with with the marsupial um, long long cutting RNA, but also the imprinted RNAs that that do the same job but over smaller regions. But they're cis acting from their cytosynthesis, whereas well, I, mean, I guess ROX has some some maybe some function in because um, the ROX genes are um, the, uh, amongst the high affinity sites for the dosage con compensation complex. So there may be some biochemical assembly associated with the, the transcribed loci. I don't know if that's been proven, but um, other than that, you know, the, obviously the Drosophila system is a trans system. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, nature and biology are very inventive. Uh, if there's no more questions, uh, we can do the last round, and it's something that, I mean, we as young um, scientists are very interested in, because um, maybe some of the people in the audience, as uh, Claire said, they weren't even born when this happened, <laughs> and for sure, I think many of them never did a northern or a southern, me included. <laughs> so what is the, some kind of advice that you would give to young researchers today? Maybe you can start. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think it's all, it's, all, it's all to do with the question, and, um, and, and, and you know, I, I've, I've been out of, I stopped doing science myself at, since the mid-90s, and um, I, I think in some ways it's much harder now, because there's so much stuff you can do, you can just do stuff, yeah. um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. And, uh, and so sometimes you're so busy doing stuff that you're not thinking about what the, what the actual what the actual question is. So I would say, think about, think about the question. So, so um, yeah. So one, one, one of the things I, I did uh, after I um, didn't find God was um, I, I worked for the Wellcome Trust for a while. And um, I tried to sort of get all the, 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 the forms redo so that people actually st actually specifically um, address what is the question? What actually is the question? Not the goal of my experiment is to blah, 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 but what is the question? Um, and then why is it important? So I think if you just focus on those two things and don't get too, too um, I mean, carried away by being able to, by all the fantastic techniques that I'm actually extremely jealous of because CRISPR hadn't been invented when I <laughs> when I was around. So, but yeah, so that, that's what I would say. Thank you. Well, that would be my answer. Oh, right. Focus on the okay. question. But uh, I mean, you could add some bits to that, like, um, you know, make sure that, the, that it, there's lots of good questions, but it's just not the right time in the sense that, that, that mm -hmm. you know, they're just not addressable. So you have mm -hmm. to work out, you know, can you really make an impact on that, mm -hmm. that, that question at this time? You know, you might have to invent some new methodologies and sort of, you know, make some steps forward. But there are other things where it's just too far away. It's just not, not really achievable. So um, that's part of the art of finding the right question. But I, I'm full of admiration for um, you know, people who do that well. I think that's the secret. Those are far better answers than mine. I will point out that not only is CRISPR new, to our era of science, but PCR is new to our era of science. <laughs> um, I would say have fun. Um, science is hard. There's a lot of times that things don't seem to be going well or fast. Um, but just remember how exciting it is uh, and have fun with it. So my, my advice would be quite simple. Don't throw anything in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Very. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. It was very interesting, even though I do remember the story about story to pates that I was <laughs> trying to teach to students who were looking at me like crazy, and I couldn't explain why he, it was fun like this. So yeah, thank you for sharing your memories, advices. Thank you to the moderators. You did a great job. We are perfectly on time. 
So we will have um, a few words about the breaking out session uh, before we go out for the group photo. And first, of course, we want to applaud our uh, guests. <laughs>